Hey, it's Kay, and this is Skittles, Hotshot Reporter. And this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. With more than 6 million users worldwide, Atlas is offering extremely affordable online protection with a huge discount going on right now, meaning you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This is a limited time offer though, so you can take advantage of this by clicking the link down in the video description. Maybe you've just seen one of my videos, and I've warned you that a popular TV show is horrible and will dissolve your brain, and you have hubristically decided that you have to see it for yourself. But oh no, it's not available in your region. Atlas VPN has you covered, while still maintaining lightning-fast speeds. One Atlas subscription protects all your devices. It blocks malicious links, ads and trackers, and even notifies you if someone is trying to steal your data. Atlas runs all your internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel that protects you from public Wi-Fi dangers and hides your IP address. You can grab Atlas VPN right now at a major discount for $1.99 a month on a three-year subscription. Just click the link in the description. So, this video is about protests. Particularly, the narratives that are constructed about protests in the media. In 2020, the murder of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin of the Minneapolis Police Department sparked nationwide protests against police violence. These protests weren't strictly about the death of one man, of course. They were the culmination of generations of frustration at not just a police force, but an entire approach to policing that many saw as deeply violent and inherently racist, much in the same fashion as the widespread Ferguson protests a few years earlier. This wasn't a series of small demonstrations, either. Polls estimate 15 to 26 million people participated in a demonstration during the summer of 2020. In the country with the highest incarceration rate in the world, in which police kill more civilians per capita than any other developed nation, and it's not even close, it is curious, then, to hear the way many corners of the media and political sphere were discussing these protests. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz insisted the protests were not really about George Floyd or police violence and had been hijacked by anarchists and other vaguely defined destabilizing elements who were, he's careful to specify, not from the city, saying 80% of those looting and setting fire to buildings were from other places. Now, this wasn't true. The vast majority of those arrested were locals, but that didn't stop the media uncritically repeating similar statements throughout the country. Here's the New York Post repeating a statement from NYPD Deputy Commissioner John Miller alleging an organized anarchist conspiracy to loot luxury stores. And here's ABC uncritically publishing New York Mayor Bill de Blasio attributing the violence at protests to well-organized anarchists. And Governor Cuomo saying, They are people who are using the protests as a cover to steal and to sow the seeds of anarchy. Here's public advocate Jermaine Williams explicitly stating that these people are outsiders, and federal law enforcement officials stating that whether these radicals are left or right wing, their goal is the same, to sow discord or inflame racial tensions. This very article contradicts itself by later noting that 80% of those arrested were from the city. But something really fascinating is happening here. Politicians and law enforcement are basically saying, hey, it could be anyone who is perceived as having radical views. But what you need to know is they're not normal people. Normal in this case meaning you don't have strong political views. These nefarious outsiders are inflaming racial tensions. Not the cop who murdered a man on camera. Not police departments throughout the country who target and harm black citizens at a dramatically disproportionate rate. No, no. It's the anarchists. It's people from out of state. People who just want to steal stuff and cause problems. There's always an outside element, someone else to blame, that allows those in power to imply that they agree with the criticism of the injustice being protested against, but they just have to keep sending in armed police to beat down protesters because there is, after all, 
a dangerous element among them. This is not new. The 60s are considered by many to be a golden age of protest and civil activism. Opposition to the Vietnam War reached a fever pitch and helped cultivate a widespread anti-war movement. The civil rights movement likewise reached its peak and the media was absolutely pissing its pants about how politically active young people were becoming. It was also the height of the Cold War, and this new wave of political consciousness was butting up against a media and political establishment who saw, or wanted the public to see, communism and Soviet influence behind every corner. Martin Luther King Jr. was famously hounded by U.S. intelligence agencies and attacked in the media as a communist agent. Now, whether MLK held communist views or not, what was important was that this narrative could be used to delegitimize the movement itself. See, it's not really about racism. It's some sort of conspiracy to destabilize American society. It's a Soviet plot. And this was in no way unique to America. Here in the UK, our media was adamant that good, wholesome British youths would never do something as unsavory as disagree with the interests of the ruling class. So they concluded there must be someone pulling the strings. Nick Thomas's article, Challenging Myths of the 1960s, discusses the way universities and the media made sense of students protesting in the 60s, saying... The protests were dismissed as the work of an extremist, revolutionary minority, acting in defiance of the student body, or as an example of the corrupting influence of this minority on the majority of students. Sir Sidney Kane, the director of the London School of Economics, during the sit-ins of 1967, blamed the sit-in on a small group of about 50 left-wing students who had enticed at most 200 of the school's total of 3,500 students to join them. In March 1968, Joffrey Martin, the president of the National Union of Students, note, the National Union of Students is not nearly as cool as it sounds, blamed sit-ins at universities throughout the country on a minority of militants and small extremist groups. The Times even warned that it is constantly repeated that the students who carry their intolerance to the borders of violence or anarchy are a very small proportion of the whole. That is doubtless true, but they have been able to impose their will on the majority, and in doing so are able to modify the character of their institutions. We start to see a pattern emerging at this point. There's this concept of this politically impartial, innocent body of citizens, and a corrupting, radical minority who turn them towards civil unrest. I'm particularly interested in Sidney Kane's statement that 50 left-wing students had enticed 200 others to join a demonstration, as if they had some kind of beguiling magic. In reality, those 200 students were probably not as politically unengaged as some would like to believe, considering those left-wing students presumably made an argument to them about why they're protesting, and those 200 agreed with them enough to join. There is also a strong narrative of foreign interference present in the 60s when discussing left-wing activism. Remember I mentioned Soviet influence a while ago. Left-wing student organizations in the UK were basically considered unofficial wings of the USSR, an attitude that would be replicated throughout Europe and America as the presence of left-wing political thought became increasingly associated with foreign Soviet interference. It is useful to combine that idea with the last part of that Nick Thomas quote, the statement from the Times about how this spooky radical minority can change the character of their institutions. A foreign enemy of your nation has agents in these activist groups, student organizations, protest movements, whatever it may be. And it changes the character of those organizations to such an extent that they effectively become an extension of that foreign enemy. Now, this might sound dramatic, because it is. It's also exactly what happened at Kent State University in May of 1970. News of the My Lai Massacre, in which American soldiers butchered hundreds of Vietnamese civilians, primarily women and children, had recently broken in America. 
This PR nightmare was coupled with newly elected President Nixon, who had run on ending the draft, going back on that particular campaign pledge, as well as expanding the war into Cambodia, helping to spark another wave of protest against the Vietnam War. There were, of course, protests around the country, as there had been for years at this point. At Kent State University, students began peacefully occupying campus to protest the war. A group of students buried a copy of the U.S. Constitution to demonstrate how Nixon had killed it. In case you were wondering what level of violent radicalism these particular protesters were operating on. Naturally, the National Guard was called in, and as a result, things began to escalate rapidly. Several students were stabbed with bayonets, and the ROTC building on campus was burned down. And yes, I said bayonets. This is what the National Guardsmen who were called into Kent State were armed with. Those are M1 Garands, rifles that were currently in use by U.S. troops deployed in Vietnam. They carried live ammunition, not rubber bullets. You can see the aforementioned bayonets affixed to the ends of each of their rifles there. This should give you some indication of how the U.S. state was reacting to protests at this point. That attitude became apparent on May 4th when National Guardsmen opened fire on unarmed student protesters, killing four and injuring nine others in what would become known as the Kent State Massacre. During investigations after the fact, many guardsmen cited fear for their lives as a major reason for firing into the crowd. Many found this a difficult story to believe because nearly everyone killed was over 100 meters away from them. One was 80. For reference, an NFL football field is just over 100 meters long, so imagine you're a National Guardsman armed with an M1 Garand at this goalpost, and you see students all the way over at that goalpost, and you give them the ol' My God, it's coming right for us! Fearing for your life, indeed. In Ken Burns' long-ass documentary on the Vietnam War, you can hear geology professor Glenn Frank begging the protesters to disperse after being told by the commander of the National Guard that if they don't, they will fire again. I am begging you right now, if you don't disperse right now, they're going to move in and it can only be a slaughter. Would you please listen to me? So, a pretty reasonable question to ask at this point is, why? Why would these guardsmen feel so threatened by an unarmed crowd of students that they would begin shooting and killing them? Why would they be perceived as such a threat that their commander would make clear his intent to continue shooting them? The day before the Kent State Massacre, Ohio Governor James Rhodes made the following statement. We've seen here at the city of Kent especially probably the most vicious form of campus-oriented violence yet perpetrated by dissident groups. We are going to eradicate the problem. I think that we're up against the strongest, well-trained, militant revolutionary group that has ever assembled in America. It's worth noting that the only people who had been hurt up to this point were students who had been hurt by guardsmen. This started with some hippies burying a copy of the Constitution and peacefully occupying their campus. But by this point, protests were imagined in the popular consciousness as a foreign attack. Just another act of Cold War aggression by the big bad USSR. These were not members of the Kent State student body expressing their opposition to the Vietnam War. This was something malicious, something dissident, something from without, not from within. Governor Rhodes's statement is worth taking in context with the broader media narratives at the time. All of those narratives would have culminated in the minds of those guardsmen. Maybe they did think they were in danger, as absurd as it might seem. Did they see a crowd of student protesters or did they see a militant Soviet cell? After all, it's pretty clear what they were told to expect. 
But the effects of these media narratives go far beyond the police or the National Guard. A national poll shortly after the Kent State Massacre found that 58% of Americans thought the killings of these unarmed students were justified. The parents of William Schroeder, one of the students who was killed, received a flood of hate mail and harassment. The general sentiment throughout this hate mail was that it was a good thing their son was dead because he was a communist. Now, even if William Schroeder was a communist, this would be indicative of how violently deranged these media narratives and Cold War hysteria had made the American public. But as far as anyone knows, he wasn't. He wasn't even a protester. He was just passing through campus at the time and caught a stray bullet in the chest. At this moment, William Schroeder was the idealized, politically uninvolved, neutral citizen that our media and politicians had warned us were being led astray by dangerous radicals. And they killed him too. The narrative had already been cultivated. These people were a dangerous, militant cell. These people were something foreign, something other from whatever any given person might consider to be normal or American. Thus, any violence against them is de facto justified. Because as far as many people were concerned, these protesters were the aggressor just for existing. As a result, the state is able to violently repress dissent with the support of the majority of the public. The Soviet Union is gone, so some of the finer details of the language have changed, but these statements from the 60s are functionally identical to the narratives that were being spread around the George Floyd protests. It's important to keep that poll about the Kent State Massacre in mind because in recent years, while the police have been violent and repressive in response to protests, the deadliest violence often comes from regular citizens. That 58% from the survey, if you will. Those sections of the population who have been whipped up into a frightened and violent frenzy by these media narratives are increasingly inspired to take things into their own hands. This is what is called stochastic terrorism. The strategy of demonizing and dehumanizing a group to such an extent that people who are not even connected to anyone doing the demonizing will feel compelled to attack that group. After all, these foreign-backed anarchists are burning our cities down. Vehicle attacks on protests became terrifyingly commonplace through the summer of 2020, with many drivers plowing through protesters killing people in Seattle, St. Louis, and Bakersfield. And one U.S. Army sergeant, Daniel Perry, murdered a protester after having previously tweeted, Now is the time to take up arms and protect yourselves against violence. And responded to a Trump tweet in June about protesters, anarchists, agitators, and looters by saying, Send them to Texas. We will show them why we say don't mess with Texas. In Kenosha, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse, who was actually a dangerous outside element who had traveled to be at the protest, ironically, arrived with a rifle in the name of protecting property. Whose? Certainly not his, but remember that politicians, the police, and the media had all made the narrative clear. There are dangerous, organized cells of outsiders coming to our cities to destroy property for no good reason. They just love doing that. So Kyle showed up to defend the precious property that he has been assured was under attack. He ends up shooting and killing two people. Just like Kent State, this is the outcome of these media narratives. Spoken by law enforcement and political actors, uncritically reproduced in the headlines of our news networks, and used to incite violent fear in the populace, directed at anyone who would dare to protest. The ideological center of these narratives is that people could not and would not organically have a problem with the way things are. That black Americans, and frankly all Americans, wouldn't have ample reason to be furious at the way police behave. The way police are so often insulated from consequences, and the way their communities are constantly told to be peaceful and respectful in response to cops killing them. 
It's impossible that good, regular people would have a problem with that. So it has to be some kind of insidious, foreign element. And look what that leads to. Kyle Rittenhouse would go on to claim that he supports Black Lives Matter. I support the BLM movement. I support peacefully demonstrating. Remember at the beginning where we looked at the techniques those in power used to imply they support the cause of the protesters while violently repressing the protesters themselves. That dissonance is passed down to the people who are incited to carry out stochastic violence in the interest of the powerful. This is a narrative and a dynamic to keep in mind the next time there's widespread protests. And there will be, because the current political answer to problems is to refuse to do anything to solve them. Because here is both former President Trump and current President Biden effectively saying the exact same thing. Dividing people between legitimate and illegitimate protesters, setting the stage for the othering of those involved in civil unrest, only with differing levels of tact. Leadership that can recognize pain and deep grief of communities that have had a knee on their neck for a long time. There's no place for violence, no place for looting or destroying property or burning churches or destroying businesses. They're not protesters. Those aren't protesters. Those are anarchists, they're agitators, they're rioters, they're looters. They're just looking for trouble. Has nothing to do with George Floyd, has nothing to do with anything. They don't even know who George Floyd is. I support the BLM movement. I support peacefully demonstrating. I support peacefully demonstrating. Peacefully demonstrating. Peacefully demonstrating.